وأقول في القرآن ما جاءت به آياته فهو الكريم المنزل وأقول قال الله جل جلاله والمصطفى الهادي ولا أتأول الحمد لله رب العالمين له الحمد الحسن والثناء الجميل وشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له يقول الحق وهو يهدي السبيل وشهد أن سيدنا ونبينا محمد صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وأصحابه والتابعين لهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين أما بعد إن شاء الله تعالى today we're going to start the sharah the explanation of the kitab Sunan Abi Dawood but the ada the norms of the scholars is before they talk or before they go into the book and they explain the book the norms of the ulama is that they they talk about the author of the book and they talk about the book itself so inshallah ta'ala today we're going to spend some time today we're going to spend some time um, doing two things the first thing inshallah ta'ala is we're going to be speaking about Imam Abi Dawood himself. We're going to be speaking about the author Abi Dawood as Sijistani, rahimahullah. And then also what we're going to do is we're going to speak about the book, Sunani Abi Dawood. Why did we choose this book? What's the significance of this book? What's so great about this book? And etc. Matters pertaining to the book. So inshallah ta'ala, I don't think that we'll be able to finish all of that today so maybe today we'll spend more time on that and the book might start tomorrow inshallah ta'ala the way that i plan to speak about al-imam abi dawood al-sijistani rahimahullah is two ways the way that i plan to speak about him is in two ways the first way is siratul imam abi dawood al-sijistani al-shakhsiyya i'm going to speak about his personal life and the second way that I'm going to speak about his life is Hayatu Al-Imam Abi Dawood Al-Ilmiyyah I'm going to be speaking about his knowledge how he attained knowledge how he gained knowledge and matters pertaining to that inshallah ta'ala and where he traveled to Once I finish speaking about Al-Imam Abi Dawood rahimahullah I'm then going to go and then I'm going to go into speaking about Sunan Abi Dawood, the book itself. And the way that I plan to speak about the Sunan Abi Dawood is At-Ta'rifu bi Sunan Abi Imam Abi Dawood. I'm going to define the book. What is the name of the book? Who are the people who narrated this book to us? How many chapters does the book consist of and how many books does it consist of? How many kutubs are in there? And how many babs are there in there? We're also going to mention the number of hadiths that are in there and the makana, the position that Sunan Abi Dawood holds. Once I finish speaking about that, I'm going to move on to the second part of the book, which is I'm going to speak about the methodology. Manhajul Imam Abi Dawood as Sijistani fi Sunanihi. I'm going to speak about the methodology of Abi Dawood in the Sunan, how his method is and the way that he authored this book. So, inshallah ta'ala. Is going to be a long, but inshallah, a beneficial uh, introduction, inshallah ta'ala. So let's go into the first chapter, which is Siratul Imam Abi Dawood al Shakhsiya. Talking about the personal life of Al Imam Abi Dawood. Al Imam Abi Dawood, his name is Sulaiman ibn al Ash'ath ibn Ishaq ibn Bashir ibn Shaddad ibn Amr ibn Amran. Al Azdiyu. But he's very, very well known as Abu Dawood as Sijistaniyu. That's what he's known as. And this name that we chose, Sulaiman ibn al Ash'ath, ibn Ishaq ibn Bashir, ibn Shaddad, ibn Amr ibn Umran al Azdiyu, is the name chosen by his student ibn Dasa. And ibn Dasa, as we're going to see, is Ahad or Ruat al Sunan. He's from one of the people who narrated the Sunan of Abi Dawood. We're going to speak about the narrators who narrated this book to us. So one of his students, Ibn Dasa, he said that this is the name of 
الإمام أبي داود سليمان ابن الأشعث ابن إسحاق ابن بشير ابن شداد ابن عمر ابن عمران الأزدي and Abu Tahir al-Silafi rahimahullah bikasri al-Sin he said after he brought the name of al-Imam Abi Dawood he says وَهَذَا الْقَوْلُ فِي نِسْبَةِ الْأَمْثَلُ وَالْقَلْبُ إِلَيْهِ أَمْيَلْ that this وَهَذَا الْقَوْلُ فِي نَسَبِهِ sorry this name that we just chose and this name that we put together he says it is the most correctest وَالْقَلْبُ إِلَيْهِ أَمْيَلُ and the heart is more inclined to that meaning because the person who is mentioning his name is who? is his student Ibn Bidasa rahimahullah and the student knows his, stu uh, his teacher more and Imam Abu Dawood became very famous بِكُنْيَتِهِ with his kunya he became very famous with his what? his kunya his name is known as Abu Dawood he became famous for that and that is what he's more famous for than his actual name. If anybody tells you today, Sulaiman ibn al-Ash'ath said, you may not know who he is. But if somebody says to you, Imam Abu Dawood said, you most likely know who he is. So he became very well known because of his kunya, rahimahullah. And Imam Abu Dawood's granddad, Imran, is min man qutila ma Ali bi sifin. His granddad, Ali, is one of the people who fought with Ali ibn Abi Talib in the battle of Siffin against the Khawarij. So he was with him. Oh sorry, against Muawiyah and the fight that took place between them. The battle of Siffin between Ali and Muawiyah, he was on the side of Ali ibn Abi Talib who got killed in that battle. And Imam Abu Dawood is Azdiyu. And Azdi is a Arab lineage, he's Arabi. Al Imam Abu Dawood is an Arab. Min Qabila til Azd. And it is bin al Qabail al Arabiya til Kubra. It's from one of the well known Arab Arab lineages. Al Imam Abu Dawood's family they traveled from Yemen and they resided in Khurasan, where the Shaykh is Rahimahullah as we're going to see where he was born. Al-Imam Abi Dawood, Rahimahullah, he's from the land of Sijistan. He's from the land of Sijistan. And Sijistan today falls in part of Iran and part of Afghanistan. The majority of it is in what? 40% is in Iran. And 60% of Sijistan is in what? Afghanistan. Rahimahullah. This is where he was. He was born. Rahimahullah. The time in which he was born, he was born Ithnaini wa The year was 202. That's the view held by his student Abu Ubaid al Ajurri. Rahimahullah. He said, I heard Samirtu Sulaiman ibn al Ash'ath Abu Abu Dawood yaqul. ولدت سنة ثنتين ومئتين. I was born the year two hundred and two. Then he was born eight years after Imam Al Bukhari, رحمه الله. Eight years after who? Imam Al Bukhari. Then Imam Al Bukhari is eight years older than who? Imam Abu Dawood, رحمه الله. Because Imam Al Bukhari was born سنة أربع وتسعين ومئة. 192 and uh, 94 and Imam Abi Dawood he died after Bukhari 19 years so he lived after Bukhari how many years? 19 years and Imam Al Bukhari uh, Imam Abi Dawood rahimahullah and Imam who was who died 19 years after and Imam Abi Dawood rahimahullah and Imam Abu Dawood was born في أسرة محبا للعلم. He was born in a family that loved knowledge excessively. His father Al Ashath ibn Ishaq. His father Abu Dawood. He is من الرواة عن حماد بن زيد. He's from the people narrated from who? He's from the people narrated from who? حماد بن زيد. 
and Abu Dawood's older brother Muhammad, he is from those people who traveled excessively to seek knowledge of hadith and to attain the knowledge of hadith. And Imam Abu Dawood, his own son, Abu Bakr, is from the what? From the people who took knowledge from him and was well known for his knowledge, his son Abu Bakr. So Abu Dawood was married, he used to have a maid, as we're going to see later, inshallah ta'ala. And he had a son whose name is Abdullahi, like in his kunya is what? Abu Bakr. And he has the famous book, Al-Masahif, that he authored, and the Ha'iyya. The Ha'iyya is written by who? Abu Dawood's son, Abu Bakr. And he's from Minal Hufad al Ma'rufin. His son is from one well of the well known Hufad of Hadith. Well, Idarika and Imam Abu Dawood, when he came to Misr, Egypt, and he met Ahmad ibn Salih, we're going to mention it later. When Abu Dawood met Ahmad ibn Salih in Misri, and Abu Dawood had his son with him, Abu Bakr, and they went together. And Ahmad ibn Salih al Misri had a policy, which is that he would never allow anyone to sit in his gathering who had no bid. Even if it was a child, he didn't care. Ahmed ibn Salih he said his condition is that the person who comes to his halaqah has to have a bid. So Abu Dawood brought what? He brought his son with him, who was very young. So when he brought his son, Abu Bakr, Ahmed ibn Salih he said, take him out of the halaqah. Why are you bringing him here? And then he said to my son, he's a strong individual. Abu Bakr, Abu Dawood saying this. My son is very strong in knowledge. Ask him anything you want. Test him with whatever, whatever comes to your mind and see if, he's, if he is, if he should stay in his halaqah. So Ahmed ibn Salih al-Misri, he tested him. And when he tested him, he realized that Abu Bakr ibn Abi Dawood was strong. Every question he asked him, he answered it. And so he said, you can stay in the halaqah. And he was the first and last person that Ahmed ibn Salih ever allowed to come to his gathering who had no bid. So this is his offspring, Al-Imam Abi Dawood rahimahullah. And also Al-Imam Abu Dawood had a brother known as Muhammad ibn al-Ash'ath. He was a bit older than him, not much, but a bit older than him. And he was his rafiq. They used to accompany each other to go and seek the knowledge of hadith and travel. And this is all what Imam al-Dhabi mentioned in his seer ala min Now we're going to go into shama'iluhu wa fadailuhu, the virtues and the nobility of this great Imam, and Imam Abu Dawood rahimahullah. And Imam Abu Dawood had great characteristics. His personality was amazing, rahimahullah. And one of the things that he was very well known is, he was an individual who had ulul himma, high aspiration. He was never pleased with the bare minimum. He always wanted to be number one. He always wanted to be first in everything, rahimahullah ta'ala. He was also well known for his amal bima alima. He was well known for following that which he knew, to implement the knowledge that he knew. He was very well known for that, rahimahullah. وَالتَّمَثْلُ sunnah, And implementing and living by the sunnah. He was well known for that. كَمَا عُرِفَ As he was also known he was very aesthetic. A person who took bare minimum from this dunya. He didn't like the dunya and he wasn't too much into the dunya. Rahimahullah. The scholars of his, of his time, they praised him for that. Some of the examples that were mentioned about his tamathul bi sunnati nabawiyati sulukan wa manhajan, that he followed the sunnah and that he was a person who held on to the sunnah, is what Al Imam al Khatib al Baghdadi mentioned bi sanadihi with his chain of narration. From Al A'mash, Sulaiman ibn Mihran, and Ibrahim, yani Ibrahim al Nakhai, and Al Qamah, yani Al Qamah ibn Qais, Rahimahullah, ibn Abdullah al Nakhai al Kufi, Rahimahullah. Can Abdullah ibn Umas, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud was a person Yushabahu bin Nabi. The people used to say Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, he re resembles who? The Messenger. The people used to say that Abdullah ibn Mas'ud. He resembles who? The Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Fi hadihi wa samti. In the way he carried himself and in the way he was. Wa kana alqamatu an alqamah yushabahu bi abdillahi. Alqamah ibn Qais 
Al-Qamah Ibn Qais ibn Abdullahi Al-Nakhai al-Kufi was very similar to Abdullah ibn Mas'ud. Wa qala Jarir ibn Abdul Hamid he said kana Ibrahim yushabbahu bi al-Qamah. Ibrahim al-Nakhai was like Al-Qamah ibn Qais. He resembled him. Wa kana Mansur yushabbahu bi Ibrahim. Mansur ibn Al-Mu'tamir was very similar to who? To Ibrahim al nakhai And Sufyan ibn Sa'id al thawri he was very similar to Mansur ibn Al-Mu'tamir. Wa kana waki' ibn Jarrah al-Ru'asi was very similar to Sufyan ibn Sa'id al thawri وكان أحمد الإمام أحمد was very similar and was resembled to وكيع بن جراح الرؤاسي and الإمام أبي داود was similar to الإمام أحمد رحمه الله يشبه بأحمد بن حنبل and this is the senet of how they resembled each other starting from who from the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم and then who Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, and then Al-Qamah ibn Qais, and then Ibrahim al nakhai and then Mansur, and then Sufyan ibn Uyayna, and then Waki' ibn Jarrah al-Ru'asi, and Ahmad ibn Hamad rahimahullah. And from Ahmad was who? Al-Imam Abi Dawood rahimahullah. So this is how he was in following the Sunnah. And Ahmad rahimahullah was very well known for his following of the Sunnah. Also, Al-Imam Abi Dawood's characteristics was Izzatu Nafsihi. He had Izzatu Nafs. He respected himself, self-respect. He respected himself. In the sense where no one could buy Al-Imam Abi Dawood, rahimahullah. And no one could give him money and bribe him, rahimahullah. Whether it's a leader or anyone else. وَلِذَلِكَ And inshaAllah ta'ala, we're going to see that soon. The famous story that took place between Al Imam Abi Dawood and the leader of his time. The Khalif of his time, Al Imam Al Muwaffaq. Al Imam Al Amir Al Muwaffaq, Rahimahullah. He came to Al Imam Abi Dawood, Rahimahullah, when the fitna happened in Basra. We're going to speak about that in details, inshallah, very soon. There's a great fitna that took place. We're going to speak about it and where the fitna came from and what was the fitna about. Al Imam Abi Dawood, Rahimahullah. The leader came and knocked on his door at night time. And when he knocked on his door, Al Imam Abi Dawood, his maid, his khadim, opened the door. And then he said, I want Abu Dawood, where is he? And he told Abu Dawood is in his room writing. So he came on to he came to him to Al Imam Abi Dawood Rahimahullah. And when he came to him and he, he said to him, I have three requests. I have three requests. And we're going to speak about that in more details, inshallah ta'ala. But from one of the requests that he had, that he put forward was that, he said, I want you to allow my children to sit and narrate from you the sunan, your sunan. The leader said in this to him. And Imam Abi Dawood, he said, okay. But he said, with the condition that you give them a majlis khas, a specific majlis for them. No one else comes except them. It's for the children of the leader. And then Imam Abi Dawood responded and he said, أَمَّا هَذِهِ as for this, فَلَا سَبِيلَ إِلَيْهَا There's no way for this. لِأَنَّ النَّاسَ شَرِيفَهُمْ وَوَضِيعَهُمْ فِي الْعِلْمِ سَوَاء Because the honorable one and the low one, when it comes to knowledge, they're all equal. ولذلك he rejected that offer or he rejected that request and so the leader later he didn't stop his children from coming to the halaqa of Imam Abi Dawood so what he did was he allowed, he, he allowed his children to come but they used to place a, a silk curtain between <coughs> the children of the leader and the general mass so they would come to the halaqa but they were kind of segregated from the rest of the uh, the people. And this is, subhanAllah, the reality of when a person becomes a leader and what it comes with. 
Those people wanted the Sunan. They were good leaders that they, they wanted their children to learn Sunan Abi Dawood. But even then, look what, what's taking place at that time. And Imam Abi Dawood was also known for his zuhd. He was a person with zahid, very aesthetic. He, he, he was pleased with the bare minimum. Rahimahullah. And he also had wara, meaning if anything was doubtful, he would stay away from it. Rahimahullah. And he was a person who was very humble. <coughs> Al Imam Abu Dawood, Rahimahullah, he used to wear the most basic clothing that there was. Rahimahullah. And one of the things that he used to say when he would put his clothes on and he wore it, and people would say things about it, is that he used to say, Mani qtasara, anyone who suffices himself, ala libasi dun, who suffices himself with clothes below everybody else, wa mat'amin dun, and food that is below everybody else, araha jasadahu. That person will bring relaxation to his body. Because he won't struggle. I want to eat this, I want to wear this, you'll stress out too much. Anyone whose clothes is below the standard and he takes the bare minimum, that individual, he would find rahatul jasad, and enjoy himself. Just put, put the clothes on, eat whatever food that suffices you. Because, ikhwa, if you go to a restaurant and you pay 10,000 pounds or 1,000 or 300 or hundreds of pounds to eat, and if a person eats a bread, both of you are the same. وَالْجُوعُ يُطْرَطُ بِالرَّغِيفِ الْيَابِسِ فَعَلَى مَا تَكْثُرُ حَسْرَةِ وَوَسَاوِسِ You could remove hunger with a dry bread. So why are you so stressed? And why are you always worried? You could remove your hunger with what? You could, with a dry bread. If you eat an expensive food, in an expensive restaurant, and if you eat a bread, both of you, both of them will take away from you what? The hunger that you have. So he was a very aesthetic person. He also used to say, al shahwatul khafiyya, the hidden <coughs> shahwa. One of the hidden shahwa is hubbul riasa, loving leadership. He used to say, this is a hidden shahwa. Many people don't know that it's in them. But it's a hidden Desire, which is hubbul riasa, being in charge, being the forefront, being at the front. And he also used to say, خير الكلام ما دخل ما دخل الأذن. He used to say, the best of speech is that which enters the ears بغير الإذن without permission. That's the best of speech he used to say. He was also a person who had tawadu, very humble person, very humble. Rahimahullah. And the thing that shows how humble he is, is that when he wrote his Risalat ila Ahli Zabid, or it's, re re it's really well known as, uh, sorry, not Risalat ila Ahli Zabid, Risalat ila Ahli Makkah, sorry. When he wrote, wrote his Risala, it's called Risalat ila Ahli Makkah, where a group of people sent a letter to him from Makkah asking him about his Sunan. How did he author it? What was his idea about his book? How did he structure it? So he wrote a book in it, uh, a letter for them in response. And inshallah ta'ala, we're going to touch on that risala inshallah soon. And Imam Abi Dawood in that risala, he says something very powerful. He says, فَرُبَّمَا تَرَكْتُ الْحَدِيثَ I might leave off a hadith إِذَا لَمْ أَفْقَهْ If I do not understand it, I will leave a hadith إِذَا Lam afqahu, if I do not understand that hadith, I will leave it. Showing that he believed that he, there was things that he didn't know. Rahimahullah, rahmatan wasi'ah. And some of us, when we learn something very small, we think that we have gathered all of the knowledge there is. So this was his tawadu, rahimahullah. And Imam Abi Dawood, wafatu, he died. After he spent years of jid and ijtihad, hard work and effort, and consistent and continuous, continuous studying and teaching, he died, rahimahullah, on a Friday, li-arba'ata'ashara baqiyat bi-shawwal. Four days was remaining for shawwal, 
when the year was 275 Hijriya, the Shaykh Rahimahullah, he died. And look at how much he used to follow the Sunnah when he died. And when he died and he was on his deathbed and he realized this is an illness that he will not wake up from. It's an illness that he's going to die from. And Imam Abi Dawood some, done something astonishing. He requested, He requested that the person who's going to wash his body is Hassan ibn al-Muthanna. He said, he should wash my body. And Hassan ibn al-Muthanna, Ibn Mu'adh al-Ambari rahimahullah, he was an abidun faqih, thiqatun thabt. He's a reliable individual. He was an individual who was known abid, a worshipper, a very well-known man for that. And Imam al-Dhahabi speaks about Ibn Sir ala bin Ubala. He said, I want him to wash my body. Because he said he knows this matter very well. He said, if he refuses, and he says he's not going to do it, for whatever reason it may be, he said, فَانْظُرُوا go and look at فِي كِتَابِ Sulaiman ibn Harbin. He said, take the kitab written by Sulaiman ibn Harbin and Hamad ibn Zaydin. And this was a kitab that was written on the janaiz, takfinu al-bayyit, the janazah, how to pray it, how to wash the dead body, and rulings pertaining to that was in that book. He said, look at that book, fa'amalu bihi, implement what is in it. I want you to, don't do however you guys want. Follow the athar and the ahadith and the marwiyat that are in that book. Follow it in washing my body. وَقَدْ حَصَلَ مَا وَصَّى بِهِ What he requested for Imam Abi Dawood, it took place and it happened. Which is that, Hassan ibn Muthanna ibn Mu'adh al-Ambari rahimahullah, he accepted to wash the body of Imam Abi Dawood rahimahullah, and the person who led the salaf was Al-Abbas ibn Abdul Wahid rahimahullah, ibn Ja'far ibn Sulaiman. He led the prayer for Al-Imam Abi Dawood and they buried him next to Sufyan ibn Sa'id al-Thawri rahimahullah. Rahimahullah Al-Imam Abi Dawood. May Allah have mercy upon Al-Imam Abi Dawood wa ajzala lahu al and give him continuous reward. وَتَقَبَّلَ مِنْهُ May Allah accept from him كُلَّ مَا قَدَّمَهُ Every effort that he put forth لِلْأُمَّةِ الْإِسْلَامِيَةِ for this Ummah وَأَسْكَانَهُ فَسِيحَ جَنَّاتِ And may Allah reside him in Jannah al-Firdaus We've now finished the first part, part of Al-Imam Abi Dawood which is Seerah to Al-Imam Abi Dawood al shakhsiyah We spoke about his personal life We're now going to move on to Hayat Al-Imam Abi Dawood al ilmiya we're now going to observe and look at his biography from the angle of the knowledge he attained and how he attained that knowledge and he's traveling around the Muslim world. Al Imam Abi Dawood started to go traveling and seeking knowledge before the age of 19, Rahimahullah. So he's considered from what? Min al Mubakkirina fi Rihalat. He was from the early people who did the Rahalat, traveling to take knowledge from the scholars. He did all of this doing al Ishirin Aman. It was, it was 19 and below. When Al Imam Abi Dawood started to travel to seek knowledge. And we're going to see in more details the places that he's traveled to and the places he went to. Al Imam Abu Abdullahi Al Hakim Al Naysaburiyu, he mentioned in his Kitab, Tariq al Dimashq, he mentions it, or even if you want. Tariq al-Dimashq was written by Ibn Asakir and the Kitab Tahrib al-Asma'i wal-Lugat by Imam al-Nawiyu they bring the statement of who? And Imam Abu Abdullah Hakim al Saburi that he said وَكَتَبَ بِخُرَسَانِ قَبْلَ خُرُوجِ إِلَى الْعِرَاقِ فِي بَلَدِهِ that he wrote in Khurasan before he went to Iraq and before he travelled anywhere else he first of all wrote from the scholars of Khurasan and then he started to travel and he said he did all of this during al Ishirina before he reached the age of 20. Compare our 20 year olds today to the 20 year olds of that time. The 20 year olds of that time, 
they saw it a responsibility on them to go seek knowledge because they believed that the Ummah one day will need them. Abdullah ibn Abbas, when he wanted to seek knowledge and he wanted to travel, he went to an Ansari man and he said to him, come, let's go seek knowledge of hadith. Let's travel, let's go and seek knowledge. And then he said to Imam Abdullah ibn Abbas, the Ansari man said, are the people going to need you when there are the kibar al-sahaba, the noble companions are alive? Do you really think that the people are going to need you? Abdullah ibn Abbas didn't listen. And he said, there will come a time when the people will need me. So Al-Imam, the noble companion of Sahabi al-Jaleel, Abdullah ibn Abbas, he went and he traveled. <coughs> Until what happened? He traveled everywhere, he met companions, he sat, he sat in front of some of the companions' houses. He wouldn't even knock their doors. Does anyone know why Abdullah ibn Abbas wouldn't knock the people's doors to take hadith from them? But he would wait for them to come out on their own accord? Does anyone know? That's out of respect. Any other reason? Timing. Yeah? Timing. He will never knock the door, whatever time it was, whenever he got there. He came. In case a female opens the door. No. Uh, uh, out of respect for knowledge, like you should go towards the knowledge. Naam, out of respect for knowledge. But any other reason other than that? That they're happy with you. That they, na'am, they were all those me, that you guys mentioned are asbab. But Abdullah ibn Abbas was interpreting an ayah in the Quran. Does anyone, anyone know that ayah is in Surah Al Hujurat? Which ayah? The one that says, uh, if you waited until the messenger came out. And, uh, who can read the ayah for us? Surah Al Hujurat. Uh, yeah, not that, yeah. If they were patient until you came out, <laughs> this is for the Prophet of Allah, but he interpreted it for everybody who took the place of the Prophet in teaching knowledge. If they only were patient until they came out on you, it would have been better for them. Now Abdullah ibn Abbas saw that ayah to uh, apply here. And so he would never ever knock on somebody's door who he came to seek knowledge from. He would wait for that person to come out on their own accord. And when they came out, he would take knowledge from them. This is honoring and venerating and glorifying knowledge and how res respect they had for it. Rahimahumullah wa radiyallahu ta'ala anhu. So Al Imam Abi Dawood did that. He traveled. He sought knowledge. But there's something fascinating of Imam Abi Dawood rahimahullah, which is that Imam Abi Dawood, he traveled after he had gained knowledge from the people of his land. This is a, something very important that we need to touch on. Which is that first of all, Imam Abi Dawood, he took from the people of his land. As we're going to see, Imam Abi Dawood traveled to 14 different places. How many places? 14 is what I have listed for me. 14 different places. Five of them was Khurasan, the land he's, where he was from. When he finished Khurasan, uh, I mentioned Khurasan, what did I say? So that's Sijistan inside Khurasan. Like in Khurasan is, it is, uh, Af part of Afghanistan, Uzbekistan, um, Iran, um, Turkmenistan. All of this land was known as what? It was all known as Khurasan. And that land known as Ray. Ray was what? It was Tehran. Tehran, which is the capital of what? 
Iran today was one time Ardu Tawheed was Sunnah. Ray was one time what? Ardu Tawheed was Sunnah. Walidalika Abu Hatim Ar Razi, Razi is a Ray. Ar Razi means Ray. Abu Zur'at Ar Razi. And the likes of these scholars, they came from where? Tehran. This is where they were from. And Allah changes things, subhanahu wa ta'ala. A land that was once a land of Tawheed and Sunnah will turn into a land which is what? al tashayyu wal kufr wal ilhad. It will change from one thing to another. This is the Sunnah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Al Imam Abi Dawood, rahimahullah, five of those places that he went to was Khurasan. And he took from the people of what? Khurasan first. He attained knowledge from them. It is upon the person that before they go to any other place, they take knowledge from who? They take from the people of their land. There's a kalam by Imam Al Khatib Al Baghdadi, where he spoke about. He said, Rahimahullah, Imam Khatib al Baghdadi, he said, Ida Azama Talibu ala Rihla, Fayambari Allah Yatruka, Fi Beledi him in a Ruati Ahadan, Illa Wektu Anu Mata Yassara min al Ahadithi wa Inkalat. Al Imam Abi Dawood said, Al Imam Khatib al Baghdadi said, If a student makes the decision of wanting to travel to seek knowledge, Fayambari, what is required first from him is Lahu Allah Yatruka Fi Beledi, that he leaves his land. Minar Ruwati, that there are people, narrators and people of knowledge are at your land, who have knowledge, who can offer you knowledge. Don't leave them and go somewhere else. Because if you say that you're going to seek knowledge when you go to Jamia Islamiyah, Medina, and you're in a land but you're not learning the Quran in your local masjid, and you're not studying in your local masjid, then what is it really going to be when you go to that country, or you go to Medina, or you go to that country that you want to go to, are you truly going to gain knowledge from it? The chances is actually very low. Well, did Alika look at him? He started with all of the lands of Khurasan. He finished it. The first land he went to is Al Imam Abi Dawood. This is all before he reached the age of what? The age of 20, Rahimahullah. The first land he went to is Hirat, Rahimahullah. He went there and he took from the scholars of that land. He took from Ahmad ibn Muhammad ibn Yasin al Harawiyu. He also went to Baghlan. And Imam Abi Dawood, he went to Baghlan. And he took from the Imam of that place, Qutaybat ibn Sa'id al Baghlani, rahimahullah. He took from him. He went to Ar Ray. <coughs> he went to Ar Ray. And when he went to Ar Ray, he had all of this before. He's actually at this point 17 years old. And Imam Abi Dawood, when he goes to Ar Ray, History wise, tarikh wise, is actually 17. He hears at that place from Ibrahim ibn Musa. He hears from Ibrahim ibn Musa al Farra al Razi, rahimahullah. Then he goes to Naysabur. And he hears from Nays in Naysabur, Ishaq ibn Rahuya. And when he went and took from Ishaq ibn Rahuya, he also waited because Al Imam Ishaq ibn Rahuya at this time became very ill. So he waited and he prayed his janazah on him, rahimahullah. Al Imam Abi Dawood also went to Asbahan. As Al Imam Abu Nu'aym al Asbahani mentioned, he went there and he took from the scholars of that land. All of those five places I mentioned, all of them are Khurasan. Now, Al Imam Abi Dawood, once he finished Khurasan, he embarked rihilatuhu ila kharij Sijistan and Khurasan. He went out. And he went to travel, rahimahullah. The first place he started with was, he started with Baghdad. <coughs> the reason why he started with uh, Al-Baghdad, because Baghdad was Hadiratul Alim Al-Islami. This was the hub. It was actually the hub of knowledge. It was the beacon of knowledge in the Islamic world. Well, the majority, a lot of scholars like Al-Imam al the author of the Kitab al-Shari'a, he was from Iraq, and it was said that he never traveled outside it. Because if you, if you were in Baghdad or Kufa and this land, 
you had it all. There was no need for you to have to travel. So when he went there, he met Affan ibn Muslim al Safar. And he took knowledge from him. And he prayed janazah on him as well. Rahimahullah. And some scholars they said that he reached Affan ibn Muslim al Safar. And when he came to Affan ibn Muslim al Safar, he just prayed janazah on him. When he got there, it was dead. And he prayed janazah on him. Also, Al Imam he went, uh, Abu Dawood he went to Basra. And when he went to Basra, he also reached there two days, they said. And some say, Biyomin Wahid, one day after the death of who? Uthman ibn al Haytham al Mu'addin. One day after he died. So this is one day after he died. Wa alaykum as Also, he traveled to <coughs> Al Kufa, rahimahullah. And Imam Abi Dawood went to Kufa. And when he went into Kufa, he stayed there. But they say they said about he they said that the length of his staying in this place wasn't too long. It was very short. He left it and he went to Hijaz. After that, he went to, in, in, in what do you call it, um, Kufa, he heard from Al-Haytham ibn Khalid al-Juhani rahimahullah and others. He went to Mecca, and when he went to Mecca, he heard from the old, and this can be said, the oldest person he narrated from was Abdullah ibn Maslamat al-Qa'nabi. He heard from him in Mecca. Abdullah ibn Salamat al Qa'anabi died the year 221. And Abdullah ibn Salamat al Qa'anabi is from the Ruwat of Sunnah Muwatta Malik. From the narrators of what? The Muwatta of Al Imam Malik. Rahimahullah. So these are the earliest people he narrated from. Ulidalika, Al Imam Abi Dawood is level to Al Imam Muslim rahimahullah, in that regard. Because Al Imam Mus Muslim. His oldest teacher is Abdullah ibn Maslamat al Qa'nabi. So, in this regard, Al Imam Abi Dawood is level to Al Imam Muslim in the narrators he narrated from. He also went to uh, Al Medina and Nabawiya and he met the scholars of Medina and he took from them. He went to Damascus, he took from another ibn Ishaq. Ibn Ibrahim al Dimashqi. And when Imam Abi Dawood saw him, he said to him, he said about him, Ma ra'aytu bi Dimashqa mithlahu. I never saw anyone like Abi Nadr Ishaq. I never saw anyone in Dimashq like him. Kana kathir al buka. He used to cry a lot. Katabtu anhu, and Imam Abi Dawood, he said, I wrote from him Sanata Thinataini wa Ishirina. When the year was 22. He also went to Hims many times. And at that place, he took from the scholars of Hims like Haywat ibn Sharik, Ibn Yazid al Hadrami. He also took from Yazid ibn Abdi Rabbi al Zubaydi and many others. <coughs> he also went to Halab, Al Imam Abu Dawood rahimahullah. And he took from Abu Tawbah, Al Rabi ibn Nafi al Halabi rahimahullah. He went to Harran, he heard from Ahmed ibn Abi Shu'aib. He went to Jazeera, he heard from Abi Ja'far al Nufayliyu, and many others. He went to Ar Ramla, number 412, he went to Tarasus, and he heard from Yahya ibn Hani al Balkhi, Nazilu Tarasus. He also went to Beirut, and he heard from Abbas ibn al Walid ibn Mazid. He went to Misr, and when he went to Egypt, as I said before, he heard from who? Ahmed ibn Salih al-Misri. He heard from him. And he took with him who? His son. And Imam Abi Dawood, he took his son with him. And when he took his son with him, Ahmed ibn Salih said, I don't allow people who don't have beards to come to my halaqah. So he said to him, he said, Ahfadu, he's more memorized, Abu Dawood saying this about his son. Ahfadu, he has more memorization and more ahadith min ashab al liha, those who have beards that are in your halaqa. Famtahinhu bima arata, test him with whatever you wish. 
So Ahmed ibn Salih, he tested him. He asked him some matters. أَجَابَهُ بْنَ أَبِي دَاوُدْ Abu Bakr ibn Abi Dawood answered them. عَنْ جَمِيعِهَا all of it. فَحَدَّثَهُ حِينَئِذٍ And so he started to give him narrations. He said, okay, narrate from me if you want. وَلَمْ يُحَدِّثْ أَنَ الْإِمَامْ Ahmed ibn Salih al-Misri that day onwards, he didn't allow anyone to come to his halaqa who had no beard to come and listen after that. If you guys have an iPhone, I could send you a picture of the map of the traveling of Imam Abi Dawood, how he looked, the lands that he went to. So I can just send it to you. You can send it to the rest of the students and look at it and see the lands that he traveled to and the places that he went to. <coughs> Rahimahullah Ta'ala. This is Jaziratul Arab. He went to Makkah al Medina. He went Baghdad. Ya Ikhwa, Baghdad. He went Dimashq. He went Khurasan. All of these are lands he walked with his foot. And today, some of us may have a lesson going in a local masjid, or we maybe an hour travel, and we may not go. These are the points that I think are very vital to take out of the rahalat of Imam Abi Dawood, the traveling of Imam Abi Dawood, rahimahullah. Number one is ittisa'u ruq'at al geographia the lands that he traveled and the distance that he cut was very vast. It was very vast. Bilad wasi'ah, lands that were very vast, and Imam Abi Dawood traveled to it, rahimahullah ta'ala. He went to Afghanistan. These are the current countries today. Afghanistan, Iran, Iraq, Syria, Urdun, Turkey, Bilad al-Haramain, and Misr. All of these are the land he traveled to. Afghanistan, and then Iran, Iraq, Syria, Urdun, Turkey, Mecca and Medina, Haramain. And Haramain, of course, is Mecca and Medina. And Misr, Egypt. All of that today is what? It's hours of flight. If one wants to travel around, how many? It's hours to travel this. And all of this he traveled, Rahimahullah. Some of them, he, some of those journeys, he was what? In Ramadan, fasting. And he was traveling. And in the deserts, Rahimahullah Ta'ala. The second benefit that you can take from his journey and his traveling was the lands in which Al Imam Abi Dawood Rahimahullah he traveled to is lands that were uniquely known for scholars that were concentrated in it. And one of the smart things in when traveling to seek knowledge is that you don't go to a land where there's only one or two people you can take knowledge from. But that you travel to a land where there's many scholars that you can take from. Because if you travel for one or two people, and when you get there, the person dies, your journey would be what? It would be of waste. You didn't attain what you wanted. But if you go to a land, if you go to a land where you want to take hadith, but there are many people, if one person dies, you have many other options of taking knowledge from other people. وَلِذَلِكَ الْخَطِيبُ الْبَغْدَادِيُ رَحِمَهُ اللَّهِ He mentions in his kitab, his rihla, he mentions that when he went to seek knowledge, he consulted his shuyukhs and his teachers if he should travel to that land. And they said to him, that land that you're traveling to, there's only one person. If he <coughs> dies, the chances of you taking from that person is very low because remember those people it wasn't hours of traveling it was months sometimes years so they might die in the court because you won't know that the person died until you get there there's no communication so they all advised him to go to places where it was populated with people of knowledge also an Imam Abi Dawood rahimahullah the third benefit that we take from it is that he gave a lot of consideration to hear, hearing a hadith from the kibar, the senior, the, those who were aged and those who were senior in knowledge. The reason is because those people, Razaqahumullah al ilma, Allah has provided them with knowledge and experience and knowledge and wisdom, hikmah. So those are the people who he chose to go to. 
those who are old, aged individuals. We're going to see that inshallah ta'ala later. Also, Imam Abi Dawood would narrate the fourth benefit that we take from his halat is that he would narrate from a person, one person in many different places. For example, he said, Katabtu an Mu'ammal ibn Ihab. I wrote from I wrote from Mu'ammal ibn Ihab, I wrote from him in Ar Ramla, Halab, and Hims. Only one person in three different places. Because <coughs> he would go here. And then he would hear that he went to another place, he would go back to him in that place so that he would take from. And also, if you look at the map, inshallah ta'ala, you will be amazed of how much traveling he did. We're going to now go into the shuyukh of Al Imam Abi, Abi Dawood, Al Imam Abi Dawood's teachers. As we mentioned before, Abi Dawood traveled a lot. Al Khatib al Baghdadi and Abu Hajjaj al Mizi, they said about him, Ahadu man rahala wa tawaf, wa jama'a wa sannaf, wa kataba anil Iraqiyin, wal Khurasaniyin, wal Shamiyin, wal Misriyin, wal Hijaziyin, wa gayrihim. He wrote from all of them. Ibn al Daqiq al Eid, he said in his Sharh al Imam, which is the Sharh of Hadith al Ahkam, he said, Abu Dawood kana lahu haddu min ulu al Isnad, ba'da abi abdillah al Bukhari. Al Imam Abi Dawood's chain was very short. Just like Al Imam al Bukhari. Wakat Sharaka fi Jama'ati Lam Yushariku fi Riwaya Ta'anum Gayruhu min Ashabi Kutubi Sita. He has narrations that him and Al Imam al Bukhari are unique in. The rest of the six books don't share that with him. Al Imam al Hafid al Miziyu, he said that the, and also Al Imam ibn Hajar. They said that the shuyukhs of Al Imam Abi Dawood are 300. And there's a Sheikh, Sheikh Abdullah ibn Salih al Barraq. He has a book called Al Mu'jab al Mushtamil, Ala Dikri Asma'i Shuyukh al Aimat al Nubl, where he mentions, written by Hafid ibn Asakir, he mentions the number of teachers that taught him, and he reached 421. That's the number he reached. Al Imam Al Hafid Abi Ali, uh, Abi Ali Al Hussein ibn Muhammad Al Jiyani, who died in the year 498 Hijriya, he wrote a kitab called Tasmiyat al Shuyukh Abi Dawood al Sijistani. And he reached 440 49. Al Imam Abi Dawood's teachers are roughly up to 500 that he took knowledge from and that were, he teach, were his teachers. But the way that we can categorize his teachers are in the following. The first tabaqah, the first level of his teachers, are those who he heard from them at an early stage in his life. And this was fi bidayat talab al ilm when he first was seeking knowledge he heard from them. And I'm going to mention eight of them. The first one is Ibrahim ibn Musa al Farra al Raziyu, Hafs ibn Umar al Darir al Basriyu, Abdullah ibn Maslamat al Qa'nabi, Asim ibn Ali ibn Asim al Wasiti, Muslim ibn Ibrahim al Farahidi, Muhammad ibn Kathir al Abdi al Basriyu. Musa ibn Ismail al Tabudaki, Rahimahullah, and Sa'id ibn Masur al Khurasani al Hafid. Those eight that I mentioned are Man Taqaddama Sama'ahum, he heard from them and he reached them. Al Imam Abi Dawood, Fi Bidayati Talabihi Lil Ilm, when he's first early in seeking knowledge. Tabaka <coughs> Thaniya, there's a next level, and these are the ones who he narrated from them a lot. These are shuyukhum alladheena akthara minhum. He narrated from them a lot of times. Number one is Musaddad ibn Musarhad al-Basriyu, Yahya ibn Ma'in, Ali ibn Abdullah al-Madiniyu, Abu Bakr ibn Abi Shayba, Ishaq ibn Ibrahim ibn Makhlad al-Handaliyu, yani Ishaq ibn Rahuya, Qutaybit ibn Sa'id ibn Jamil al-Baghlaniyu, Al-Imam Ahmad ibn Muhammad ibn Hanbal, Hanad ibn Sarriyu, Ibn Mus'ab Abu Sarriyu al-Kufi, Muhammad ibn Ala ibn Qurayb al-Hamdaniyu, Ahmad ibn Salih al-Misriyu, Muhammad ibn Bashar, Muhammad ibn Bashar al-Basriyu, who's known as Ibn Bandar, Allah, and Muhammad ibn Yahya al-Zuhali, Allah, Muhammad ibn Yahya ibn Abdullah ibn Khalid al-Zuhali, Allah, and Naysaburi. And other than them, these are the ones who he narrated a lot from them. 
We're going to see the number of times he narrated from them in his Sunan. These are the 12. Then we have the Tabaqa to Tharitha, the third level. They are a people that are like his peers. They are level to Imam Abu Dawood. They're like his Akran, his contemporaries. From them is Al Hassan ibn Muhammad al Sabbah, Umar ibn al Khattab al Sijistani, Al Abbas ibn Walid, Abbas ibn Muhammad al Duri, Muhammad ibn Auf al Ta'i. These are the ones who are like his Akran, but he narrated from them and they narrated from him. Now I'm going to mention, inshallah ta'ala, scholars who we can say they are the ones who Imam Abi Dawood narrated the most from. They're 20. They, these 20, if you memorize them, they're the most common 20 narrators that keep coming in Sunan Abi Dawood. And if you do memorize their names, then it would be easy for you to memorize the chain if you ever want to. The first of them is Musaddad ibn Musarhad, who died in year 228. Al Imam Abi Dawood narrated from him 539 times in his Sunan. So he's the most. A lot of the times we're going to see that. Haddathana Musaddad ibn Musarhad al Basri, who's going to say that a lot of times. This is from the most famous and the most common Shaykh of Al Imam Abi Dawood. And he narrated from him 539 times. The second person in number is Abdullah ibn Maslamat al Qa'nabi, who died in 221 Hijriah. And he narrated from him 329 times. I mean, 336, 336 times, sorry. The second is, is Musa ibn Ismail al Tabudaki, who died in year 223. He narrated from him 314 times. He narrated from him. And then we have Uthman ibn Abi Shayba, is the author of the Musannaf. And he narrated from him 282 times. And Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal, who died in year 240, 41 Hijriah. He narrated from him 229 times. Qutayb ibn Sa'id ibn Jamil, al-Baghlani, rahimahullah. He narrated from him 155. And Imam Ahmad ibn Salih al-Misri, he narrated from him 149 times. Abdullah ibn Muhammad al-Nufayli, he narrated from him 142 times. Al Hassan ibn Ali al Hawlani, he narrated from 132 times. Muhammad ibn Kathir al Abdi, he narrated from him 129 times. Muslim ibn Ibrahim al Farahidi, he narrated from 108 times. Muhammad ibn al Muthanna al Basri, he narrated from him 100 times. Hafs ibn Umar ibn al Harith al Namari, he narrated from him 98 times. Muhammad ibn al Ala ibn Quraib al Hamadaniyu, he narrated from him 85 times. <coughs> Ahmad ibn Umar ibn Sarh, he narrated from him 80 times. Muhammad ibn Yahya uh, al Zuhali, he narrated from him 71 times. Muhammad ibn Bashar al Basri, uh, who is known as Bandar, he narrated from him 68 times. Sulaiman ibn Harbin, 64 times. Hanad ibn Sirri, he narrated from him 66 times. Ibrahim ibn Musa al Farra al Raziyu, he narrated from him 55 times. Those are the people he narrated the most from in his Sunan. And those are who he, rahimahullah, took a lot from. But the people who we can say, عليهم, that he specialized in, he spent his life with, he sat under, are generally three people. And Imam Abi Dawood, rahimahullah. The first one of them is Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal, rahimahullah. He stuck very close by him and he took knowledge from him. And also Yahya ibn Ma'in. And the third one is Al Imam Ali ibn al Madini, rahimahullah. He benefited from all three, three of them. Istafada minhum, benefited from them. Wa And he transmitted their opinions. If you read Sunan Abi Dawood, you will see that he transmits the views of Imam Ahmad and the views of Yahya ibn Ma'in in Jarh al Ta'adil. And also Ali al ibn al Madini. And Ali ibn al Madini is the man that Al Imam al Bukhari said. Mastasgartu nafsi, I never belittled myself in the presence of anyone. And Imam al Bukhari is saying this. I never belittled myself in the presence of anyone the way I belittled myself in the presence of Ali ibn al Madini. Bukhari is saying this. So Ali ibn al Madini, Abu Dawood stuck with him a lot. 
Al Imam Abi Dawood and Al Imam Al Bukhari, you have something in common that the rest of the Urwat of the six books don't have. And you know what that is? Only those two scholars, Al Imam Al Bukhari and Al Imam Abi Dawood, were only the Mujtahid Mutlaq. They were the only two who reached Darajah, which was Mujtahid Mutlaq, in which they could do Ijtihad Mutlaq. Who were they? Al Imam Al Bukhari and Al Imam Abi Dawood. They were Fuqaha, Mujtahideen. They had their Ijtihadat. Like in all the other Ruwat, like Muslim and Tirmidhi and Ibn Majah and Nasai and other than them, they were not. كانوا يتقيدون على مذهب أهل الحديث. They were restricted according to the madhab of Ahl al-Hadith. That's what they would follow, meaning they would choose between the views of Al-Uza'i and Sufyan al-Thawri and the A'imma, they would choose from them. Like Al-Imam Abi Dawood and Al-Imam Al-Bukhari, they wouldn't. They would look at the Nusus, the Kitab and the Sunnah themselves, and they would extract the ruling themselves. Whether anyone agreed with them or not, it wasn't their, they didn't care about that, because they reached that level. And that's what Shaykh al-Islam al Taymi rahimahullah mentions in his Majmu' al-Fatawa. Um, the time caught up with us. So we'll stop here inshallah ta'ala. We'll take questions and answers, but tomorrow we're going to carry on from the Mu'allafat of Imam Abi Dawood rahimahullah that he authored. And we're going to carry on Hayat al-Imam Abi Dawood al-Ilmiya. And we're also going to speak about the book and inshallah then we're going to go into the kitab because there's no benefit brothers if you don't know the book and you don't understand the book and its value and what this book is about there's no point you going into the book straight away to understand it anything which I have said that was wrong فَإِنَّهُ مِنِّي وَمِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ وَاللَّهُ وَرَسُولُهُ بَرِئَانِ مِنْهُ Allah and His Messenger are free from it سُبْحَانَكَ اللَّهُمَّ بِحَمْدِكَ أَشَدُ وَلَا إِلَهِ إِلَّا اللَّهِ أَسْتَغْفِرُكَ أَتُوبُ